So welcome all to Travel Memories program today. Um, my name is Priscilla and I'm on staff here at Red Deer Public Library. And it's my pleasure to introduce Brenda and Jerry again as our returning speakers. Most recently in December, they talked about Northern India and uh, that particular program is still available on the library's YouTube channel. But today we're gonna hear about Southern India and, and Mumbai. Um, so before we took this Travel Memories program virtual, they also did a presentation for us in June of 2019 on Sri Lanka. So with today's talk on Southern India, they'll have pretty much covered South <laughs> India for us. But as you'll see on the map coming up, there's, there's a whole world out there of, of talks they can do for us. But anyway, this is a good start. Well, first of all, thank you for having us back again. Um, we love our photography and we love our travels. And what's the point of doing that if you can't share this with everyone else? So as you can see by this opening slide, we have done extensive travels and we just love it. And we've already got plans for 2022 for some new trips. But today, let's head, whoops, I'm reading for my husband there. Let's head for India. And this time we'll head for Southern India. It's much more relaxed and laid back down there. So this trip isn't as intense as the last moving one. I know there was a lot of information in that last one. So Shukriya, thank you for joining us and let's head. Okay, just another reminder of where we were. As you can see, the Northern part we covered last time. We're going to go this time as well as to the top blue dot in Mumbai. The climate was warmer and definitely wetter, as you can see by this. The vegetation was extremely different. And where we land is in Cochin. Now, you see with a K there, but it's also spelt with, um, with a C, depending on which map or which area you actually look at. Look at. Obviously different from where we were at the roadways, were absolutely filled with huge, huge billboards. And as I say, we always try and take a picture of McDonald's to show people the different ways it's presented. Cargo is brought to Cochin by sea. They have a huge port there. And these trucks are actually awaiting for their load to arrive. So they line up for hours and hours waiting for the ships to come in. Or some of them would perhaps be waiting to actually unload as well. This is Bollywood country, and we were, it was astounding to see some of the, um, the billboards of, and I'm sorry, I don't have one here, but of a movie that we knew, but then it was presented in Bollywood style with the, the writing and the, um, the language on it. This is by far jewelry. Um, place. Now, in the inset there, you have the size of the billboards. Cochin is right on the ocean, and one of their tourist attractions has now become the ancient method of fishing with the cantilevered Chinese fishing nets. So you can see they were first used in 1350. So the nets are dropped into the water at high tide, and then they are left there for X number of hours. Um, and then they pull them up, and you can see here all the guys had a chance to pull up about 50 kgs of weight. About seven different families would, um, would work the net for the owner. John was here explaining it to us. The owner gets 30% of the profit. The workers get 70% of the profit. The only fish at high tide because that's when the fish actually comes in to the port. And obviously fish is a huge part of their diet. And there was quite a few displays right along the edge and we love seeing you see the octopus on the right there. Um, always fun to see what's on display in a market. And very close by, we visited St. Francis Church. And you can see here it was built in 1502. And I want that long white thing along the top there is. And 
the boys would be outside pulling the rope and pulling the fan back and forth to cool the, the church off. And you can see that Queen Elizabeth visited here in 1997. And you can see the name of the fan there as well. Beautiful church. Vasco de Gama was buried here in 1524. Um, but, but then he was taken back to Portugal 14 years later. So the two inscriptions all around the church are either in Dutch or in Portuguese. Very ornate tuk tuk. And of course, they are all over the city as well. All sorts of fashion visible. That was actually a lot of fun. So lots of, as you can see, um, westernized dress, but most of the men, because the heat, would wear the dhoti. And you can see that in the bottom right two pictures. And you can, you can um, fold them many, many different ways so they can be short, they can be long. And, and they, the men would be always rewrapping them and tying them. You can see the guy in the top left looks like he needs to maybe have a, a little bit of help. But it was kind of fun watching to see what people were wearing. Very common, um, lots and lots of fruit growing in summer. Much of the country is covered, as I say, in fruit trees, also rubber trees, but rice is growing in the lower areas and they can sometimes get four crops a year in these low areas. Rubber is huge business and men that own the farm, the, the rubber plantations are very, very rich. The farmer makes the rubber mats. If you look at the top right, he's actually holding a rubber mat. And then that's, that's their product. And then they ship them to various tire country, sorry, tire companies. So these are the kind of houses that would be owned by the rubber barons. So we saw lots of very, very incredible housing in this part of India. And then we had inland. And this is brand new terrain here compared to the rest of India for us. And um, absolutely scenic, scenic country. And we love the signs that warned us about driving, you know, telling us there's curves ahead or there's a cliff ahead. And, and I specifically like the top left hand one, control your nerves on curves. We couldn't do much about the driver <laughs> except sit back and he was fine. So as we get inland a little bit makes a difference, we end up in tea country. And the hillsides here are perfect for this crop, which was actually started by the British. Most of the tea in this area is picked by hand, and I would say that has to do with the sloping. And an Indian can drink seven or eight cups of tea a day. That's actually very, very natural for them. And it makes for great scenery. And we arrive at our humble abode for the evening. I believe I mentioned in the other part of India that we had amazing accommodations. It was great. But we headed off immediately. We just dropped our suitcases and headed off to another nature reserve to look for wildlife. And they say tigers, but we did not see any tigers. But we saw monkeys with very tidy hairdos. We quite enjoyed that. And we toured by boat. So this was extremely relaxing. You just sit back and we did have our, our telephone lens and what, we had our binoculars as well, Jerry. And, yeah. um, you know, and they pointed out things on the shore. We saw quite a variety of animals. Um, you can see the sambar on the top left. Um, the, well, you can see the, the big side. And if you look carefully, I don't know if I can point to the screen. Jerry will put the, put it on here. This is an osprey. Look at the size of the fish that that osprey had. So we actually saw quite a, quite a fun group of, um, of animals. And then the evening was just fantastic. These cute, cute girls um, did an incredible dance, and that's the, the cultural dancers, and that's the name of their tribes, but I will not even try to pronounce them. And Brenda was so proud she was taller than them. Yes, that's <laughs> true, the bottom picture. <laughs> Doesn't happen often. 
And of course, sitar music is just a wonderful, wonderful, soft type of music. And this was actually the only sitar we saw in India. We saw other instruments, but but really glad we had a chance to be up close and personal with, the, with this fellow. Now, the next day, we headed out on the road, and um, our, our little bus, we're in the bus, passes this um, Bulgati. Sorry, we've got this thing on the bottom. I'm having trouble seeing. Um, I don't know how to get rid of that. No, That's no. okay. Anyway, look at the warning sign on the back of the on the back of the cart. It's called a Bulgati, and the warning is for cars that are zipping by. Ice farm, and of course the snails in the south were so so different. Ice farm is how incredibly um, reasonable it is to, ex to to pay for your spices. If you look where it says cloves there. Okay, so each one of those little tiny things has a clove in it. And this is on a big tree. Like, no wonder cloves are so expensive. Yet, uh, it just makes perfect sense. And we were able to try a lot of spices. And, and um, you know, he explained them. And some I had never, ever seen before. So it was very enjoyable. Everything from coffee in the bottom left-hand corner to the ornamental flowers. Uh, made the hike very, very enjoyable. And you can see the very hot pepper. It's very small, but it's very deadly. Yet, um, we did not try that, by the way. Now, pepper plants are grown at the base of trees, so the vine can stretch upward. So they don't just sort of have a, a pepper plantation. They would just sort of plant pepper wherever they had an available tree. Nice, colorful bird, the bobo. And this was a very interesting shrine that was quite secluded. There weren't any, there wasn't a village around or anything. And you can see we had to climb up to it. It was on the top of a hill. I did a great view over the teep. Now here you can see that there are trees planted throughout the plant, throughout the tea crop. And that is another cash crop. It could very well be cashews, but it also helps secure the um, the hillside for you know when there's flash flooding or anything like that the trees help secure the soil. The tree factory that we visited um, had 400 employees. Um, they provide housing and schooling and medical are provided as well as they get free tea. And this just gives you an example of how tea is made and it was fascinating. We saw a chance to see every operation you know, as, as we followed along. And um, you can see that it, it dries for 14 hours just in, a, in an area to, and then it is shredded and crushed, and then it has to be oxidized, and then it has to be cleaned and graded and sorting, and then tasting. And um, it's, it's very, very interesting. It, it really is. The new teas, I'm sorry, the new trees, I thought that was very, very interesting. They have to be protected from the sun because they can actually get um, sunburned. So they use the old tea trees or tea shrubs. Can actually spray them sunscreen. And if you look at the inset picture, it's a manual. And then the tea leaves fall into the bag. And that would be an incredibly tedious thing. Uh-oh, what did we do here? There we go. Okay, um, I was before I go on to this one, I'll just say that new planting occurs um, as tea only lasts a certain number of years as well. And so you have to continually replant and replant. Sorry. Um, Indian construction was <laughs> fascinating. Um, to me, it just it, it doesn't look solid, but there were men scrambling all over this building, so I'm sure it's it's safe. Um, you can see there how they use their their bed poles and struts there. I don't think I want that job. So we arrive at Kumarakam, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And this was just a whole other world. It truly was. So we actually went over the bridge. You can see in the top left, and then parked our vehicle and um, piled our suitcases and ourselves into into a boat and away we headed for the Cocoon Lagoon Resort.
incredibly popular houseboating area, as you numerous, numerous houseboats. So this is actually where we are. This is the resort we are in, and it's on the lake. You can see the lake there, and it's called Bem Bem Adu Lake. So we sat watching the fishermen, and when we were well, they're not in swimming. They are walking in the lake and fishing. And what they do is they slap the water to direct the fish into the fishing nets. Now, obviously, you can see, I mean, there are men in boats as well, but there were quite a few that were, um, that were walking around the lake. Very, very interesting. And thought this was just a very picturesque picture of this fishing nest. There was quite a bit of boat traffic, most of it being tourists. Um, you can see the inset there, the darter, which is a kind of a bird. Um, well, again, lots of houseboats, lots of fishing boats, um, but, but a lot of tourists. We enjoyed the resort immensely. <laughs> and every morning they bring their lawnmowers out. These are venture cattle, and they're the prize of Pala, which is this um, state that we're in. And um, so they take them out and they just chew on the grass all day that like we never ever did snow on or anywhere. So that was quite enjoyable. This resort had fantastic bird life. I hope you can see the, um, the name at the bottom here. This is a blue-tailed bee eater. And um, with a little patience, we were able to get the pictures that we wanted of the bird life. We love the fact they had unusual combinations, like so there was a crow, pheasant, the magpie, robin, and um, very, very interesting in, the, in, in that regard. And colorful insects, of course, being surrounded by water, the insect life was fantastic. And we brown-backed red marsh hawk. And um, we probably could have stayed longer, but we did have a tour to attend. So you can see all the different kinds there. And again, the bird, like you can see the egret, the, the purple swamp hen, the open billed stork, the bittern, um, just, just fantastic life. So our tours, we went for a walk basically back to where we got on our boat um, to go to the resort, but it was fabulous. This is the main road through the village. The village just follows the canal. So we were able to see what their life was actually like. I'm sure this girl wore the dress to match her house just for us in this photograph. <laughs> it was pretty interesting. And then we saw Grandpa and his little grandsons. He's taking um, care of his grandsons while his, while his family works. The little, the youngest boy has coal on his eyes. If you remember, that's to keep away the evil. And then on the insert, you can see them working on, um, working on building a canoe. And um, everybody has a boat. Everybody's on on the canal. And the two young guys just loved having their picture taken. They're smiling there. This is called a wooden canoe, and you can actually see the, the stitches. This lady was scaling the caramine fish for supper, which I thought was fascinating. She just sat. I don't know how these ladies can sit squatted like that. They're just, they're just amazing. And they just sit and work and work. And we did have caramine fish um, for one of our meals. These women are washing clothing in the canal. You can see them beating them on the rocks. We saw lots of that happen. Now the area away from the canal is used to farm fish. So if you look down like between the, um, the high areas with the palm trees, it's all fish farming. And the palm trees would be for growing palm nuts or perhaps for the palm toddies, which I'll tell you about in a minute here. So palm toddies, we followed the fellow on the left-hand side there. We were walking behind him and I, so I asked a question. Well, he had just come from his palm tree. So they tap a palm tree, they get the juice from the palm tree and they make it into a palm toddy. So I says, well, can we try it? So our guy said, sure. So he calls to this guy and you can see he's got his tools with him and stuff. And, and we had a taste 
of the, the palm toddy. Now, don't change it yet there, Jerry. You can see the palm, um, the container that's collecting this, the drink is in the middle there. The drink is just above it. The drink from this man was incredibly strong. I mean, it was brutal. But then we went to the ends and we went stopped in at the bar and we had another toddy and it was much better. It had a little bit of lemon in it. And um, this inset of this picture, I asked, well, how's, you know, like this guy looks like he's pretty healthy. And well, sure he is. He drinks a palm toddy every single day. <laughs> and so we had a lot of fun with that. Tourism is huge business there. Look at their decorative boats. They're just amazing. And you could stop by the road and just hire a canoe for a beautiful paddle down the canal. Sunset cruises are another option from our resort. And you can see that it's just, just spectacular. The sun was very much, our, our, go ahead, Jerry, was a red blazing ball. And we don't know if there was smoke in the air or if that would be pollution from, you know, from the cities. We, we weren't sure, but it was fantastic. This isn't much of a photograph, but it's pretty hard to photograph bats at night. So after the sun had set, these huge fruit bats were flying overhead. And uh, it was just amazing to hear them and to see them while we were enjoying happy hour under the stars. So the next morning, it's houseboat time. And we head off on a houseboat adventure. This is an example of four of our group. There are about a, go ahead, Jerry. There are about a thousand houseboats that are plying the waters in this area. And they vary from, you can get a one bedroom one or a four bedroom one. And our group was divided into three boats, but these two and of course the one that we are on. It was very comfortable and we had great service. Um, quite plain, like it wasn't elegant, but it was very, very nice. And if we wanted to sit right up with the cabin, we could and for the best view. Now, he didn't speak much English, so we couldn't get a lot of information from him, but we had our guide on our boat, and we asked question after question after question, and um, very, very informative. And of course, some of the local traffic on the lake was really fun to photograph as well. Now, across the lake, we start to get into channels. So some of the channels are the ones that we navigate and other channels are the ones that actually get flooded for the rice fields. It was an amazing type of farming. They can flood, now it's hard to see the depth in the picture, but they're usually about two meters lower than the channel. So they can flood the lower land when necessary. So here you can see the crop is well along or perhaps even have been harvest. And so it's not flooded, but they can open gates and actually flood the entire thing. So these rice patties, and you can see that in the inset, those are big bags of rice, and they are carrying them from the field to the edge of the water where a boat will pick them up. But about two meters lower is, is uh, usual for the rice fields. And then this is a, a rice combine, and they were working on this particular field. So two crops of rice are produced here and here. And you can again see the men carrying the, the rice at this point. So the hopper from the combine piled the rice just in a pile in the field. Ladies were there putting them into bags and then the men would carry them right to the edge of the water. Um, and another big crop is um, cattle feed. It is gathered here and then taken for sale all around southern India. Now, what takes us a full day of meandering can actually be done by about 45 minutes by a speedboat. But this was so relaxed and um, we got a chance to really, really enjoy the, the scenery and to see, you can see the locals fishing. And then we tied up and we had lunch and enjoyed one of the curamu fish. Um, very, very good, absolutely excellent. And we had good, good cooks on our boats. And then look at some of these houses and yards you have to imagine they have to teach their children very, very young how to swim. I mean, if you take one step off the path, you're gonna fall into the, into the water. And look at the low rice land behind here. You can see quite a bit, um, you can see it's quite a bit lower here. And from the front step, people were actually fishing in the canal as we went by as well. And oh, I just love this. Anywhere there was an open space, 
there was a little group of boys playing cricket. But three different times we saw them trying to fish their ball. You can just see it where the red arrow is. They're trying to fish the ball out of the water. Now we tried to get it, but missed it, unfortunately. But they must have an incredible selection of cricket balls because, as I say, three different times we saw them hit the ball into the water. This canal corners, so it just shows that we sort of went up and down and around. Another view of the fields. There were many ways to navigate the river. So there's water taxis, like this one that'll carry people, it'll carry the mail, even livestock and goods to all the little villages that are along the river and lake. And you can see the kids going from one side to the other and taking their boats. There was quite a bit of traffic. I'm assuming all these guys would probably have specific routes that they go to so you don't um, have any traffic problems with other households. So every little village area that we, that we passed by and we were approaching our spot for the night here, we would see laundry being done, we would see fishermen, and then the inset picture, the kids are diving into the water to cool off. Always action along here. There were, there were kids walking home from school. Um, you can see the ladies are carrying something. The men probably have rice. And uh, in the middle picture there, there's always that local group of men that are sitting and talking and solving the world problems. Coffee time. Coffee time. <laughs> Okay. And these girls are heading home, and I was just astounded at the way they got home. At least they have a rope to hang on to. I honestly don't know if I would feel comfortable doing that. Jerry could zip across there. I don't know about me, but that was that was fun. And the same thing here. I mean, these guys actually had to dip their heads to get under this particular bridge. So we're just walking into the village. And this group of men is playing what's called Korean board. I thought it was very, very similar to our crokinole, if you know what crokinole is, but there was a pocket in each corner for scoring, and they were actually betting on it. And they were friendly, they wanted to know if we wanted to try, and um, they, as I say, friendliest people that we've ever met. And smiles, as you can see, on all the faces. They're beautiful people. Our day concluded with, with great conversation around the boat. We all, we all got together on one boat to eat um, delicious food. And then we were given a lesson on how to wear a doji. So our, our, one of the, um, the ship workers showed us how to, how to wrap a doji. The next morning was so quiet and so peaceful and so still. It truly was a, another magical experience for us. There were a few birds that were singing, but take a look at this gecko or a newt or salamander. Look at the tension on the water as it just lays there. And um, we didn't go very far from our boat. We're actually photographing almost right off the boat. It was just beautiful. This guy, however, an Indian crow, they can be pretty noisy, just like our Canadian crows. Now we got a chance to see a snake boat, and that's the top picture. Snake boat racing occurs here um, every August. It's a 1.5 kilometer race with a crew, a maximum crew of 105 people in a boat that's 131 feet long. So two men play the drums to keep the beat, one man sings to keep the pace, and 30 goats will represent the villages. And they say that they expect 10,000 spectators every year to take in this event. Can you imagine? what these canals would look like then. And then we head back to the lake and that concluded our houseboat adventure. And we got a tuk-tuk ride to take us back to the main road. And we're back with the taxis and the cattle. Now Indian drivers decorate, paint, and name their vehicles. I would just love to see one of these vehicles heading down Highway 2. They're just amazing. You know, just imagine this truck on our road and what a sight it would be. We again pass more of the amazing architecture as we're heading back towards the ocean. If you take a look at these signs, we are so glad that we didn't have to navigate. Even in English, I can't pronounce those words. Now, Kovalam, I can certainly pronounce, but 
The top one is actually known as TDP. I think it's known, it's got an abbreviation. The fruit, absolutely delicious and very plentiful. And our last hotel was simply, simply stunning. We just loved it. This was one of the eternity pools. We didn't go in this one because it was our favorite one overlooking the cliffs. And you can see that's Jerry in the pool there. And our view from, from the hotel, from our rooms, is overlooking the beach. But first, before we could do any swimming or beach time, we headed into TBP. Um, and you can see that's up there. The Holy Serpent City in India. And the name of the temple means a god holding a lotus in its navel. The temple is known as the richest in the world, containing 1.2 trillion in gold. The current king or maharaja must visit every single day or pay a fine. We were certainly not allowed inside. Only Hindu are allowed inside, and they must be dressed very simply, like, like just in a dhoti. But 10,000 people a day will visit this amazing temple. And beautiful, beautiful carvings adorn it. These paper mache guards protected the path leading to the temple. There had just been a festival, one of the two major festivals a year, and that's why the, the paper mache guards were there. The next building we visited was the Palace Museum, built in 1845. And the highlight of this palace are the 122 laughing horses that are lining the roof there, carved out of teak wood. Beautiful, beautiful gardens in the area. And we do have to comment on the toilet facilities. Now, if you remember from last time, um, we mentioned like you can get a temple every 200 meters, but to find a, a public toilet is, is almost impossible. And this peak building that we went into was a public toilet on the road. And let me tell you, it was probably the worst toilet I'd ever been in in my entire life. But when you gotta go, you gotta go. Oh, and bring your own toilet paper. Sometimes we had to pay, well, most times I would say we have to pay. The one thing I never ever understood is why you had to pay more for a toilet than you did for a urinal. I don't know about that one. Now our hotel, you can see by the arrow there, sat above the beach and lots and lots of locals out enjoying the shore. The women usually went into their knees no further. Now we were in our bathing suits, but we had cover-ups over top because we knew that we had to respect their, their ways. The ladies seem to have fun no matter how far they went into the water. And I cannot resist sharing this lady's earring. I was just astounded. The, um, the hotel had a private section of the beach so we would feel comfortable in our bathing suits. And so I got a chance to swim in the Arabian Sea. And we thoroughly enjoyed watching the fishermen who were actually jumping continuously and if you can see them in the inset there, I thought they just jumped right into boats. On the other side of our hotel um, was a busier beach area, actually, and lots and lots of swimmers in it. You can see it's a very, very busy place. And then at nighttime, the lights came on, the music blared, but we actually stayed at the hotel to watch some beautiful dancing once again. Now that, that finished off our, our visit to, to Cochin, but there's two amazing things that happened in Mumbai. Now, we obviously saw a lot more than what I'm going to show you, but we can't get too in depth. So actually, is you're supposed to do something that you never expect any good luck. And one of the things people do is feed pigeons because they know they'll never get, you know, they're not expecting anything back from the pigeon. You will see a vehicle stop on a roundabout, open the window, and throw a handful of bird seed out to feed the pigeons. Rather fascinating. Yes. So this is the beautiful Marine Drive. It was built in the 1920s and 1930s on reclaimed land. Mumbai was originally on multiple islands, but they were all connected by reclamation. 
The roads were just about as busy as New Delhi, and over 100,000 of the black and gold taxis are everywhere, but people prefer trains. We enjoyed driving through the city, though. We could observe what old money built and what new money is building. And of course, you get a chance to see conditions like these. Now, the reason I brought this slide in specifically is this is the home to the washermen that we are about to see. This is the Dobi Gap. This is the largest laundromat in India. Fascinating. So the woman of the house would call her Doti. Most of the items are labeled, but with constant washing, of course, the labels were all clients' clothing. So you can see here they come in a bundle, and then the Doti will wash, dry, and iron the clothing. Now, there's about 900 different cement cubicles, so there'd be 900 dotis, approximately. Um, the soap is made of edible oils. They say there's no harsh, harsh chemicals. No women can be dotis because they say it's so labor intensive. Some women do have washing machines, but they have no place for drying. And apparently 80% of women would not even know how to iron. Look at all the damage. Can you imagine how heavy that is? And the organization has to be incredibly flawless to keep everything running smoothly. Lower end hotels will bring their sheets here for cleaning. Now, also of interest, there's no pegs used on um, on these clotheslines. It's a twisted rope, and then the clothing is stuck between the twists of the rope. So if it rains, the clothing can be spread over ovens to dry. Later in the day, the whole area smells like charcoal because the irons are heated over charcoals. And what I love is back then, it was three rupees to iron a shirt, so five cents to iron a shirt. Five cents to clean a sari. Now, I never want to do this job. The next interesting thing I want to share with you is the Daba Wallace. I just love the name. They're another special profession in the city. Now, some men will travel up to four hours by train to get to Mumbai to go to work. Way too early to pack a hot lunch. So the wife back home makes them a hot lunch, sends it in by train much later, so it will keep hot. And then a Daba Walla picks it up at the train station and delivers it to its client for $10 a month you can have a hot meal every day. If you wanted to have a catering, it'd be up to $20 a month. Now, 100,000 lunches arrive at the train station and they have to be sorted for delivery. But they are so organized that it only takes about 45 minutes to get those lunches sorted and then on to the various forms of transportation. Oops. And the last thing I will say on that is the empty pails are picked up and returned to the so it has to be repeated again the next day. Sorry, Jerry, that was my fault. So to include, to conclude this kind of little section is we stopped at, a, it was located in the building where Gandhi had actually lived and worked over a few books in, this, in his library. And it was a special section with the ones that he had personally read. On the second floor of the, of the library was a room where Gandhi had lived, and it has been preserved as far as possible in the original setting. Take a look at the sandals on the floor. They're very, very unique. They're completely made out of wood, and they just have kind of a wooden peg in them for you to, to put between your toes. And that's kind of a fitting way to, to think about Gandhi as we wind down this presentation, a beautiful statue of them. These are the coins from India and the colorful bills, although you can see these are very, very well used. And then here's just a little bit. This is a quote that I read about a lady who had written a book on India, and I'm sorry I did not give her name, but such a highway of life exists nowhere else in this world. And I just want to, I'm going to read a couple of things off of there. Um, so 17.5% of the world's population lives in India. 
compared to 4.5% in the United States. It's a very, very young population, 35. 35 million are added. And that's one reason why um, people are one of their biggest exports. People um, feed, oh, I mentioned that earlier. Yeah, people feed pigeons. So um, for good luck, it, it puts you closer to heaven, is what it does. There's hundreds of gods, and we enjoyed hearing about some of them. Like, for example, we passed um, a monkey temple. And um, Tuesday is monkey god day. So they have fascinating beliefs, and, and we really enjoyed learning about them. Um, there's lots of electricity. You can see it's hydro, coal, or nuclear. But not every village has electricity all day. Some will only have it for eight hours a day, and then, then there's nothing. Um, marriage is not forced, but apparently very quality controlled. So they see 100 to 500 suitors would visit one eligible female. It's certainly not like that <laughs> in Canada. <laughs> um, the caste system does exist, but it's not as well defined as it was. But it is definitely still there. And wherever we travel next, we wish, we wish you a, a very, very happy journey. And I'll just, we'll just continue for a moment. This is our, our blog site. I, I don't usually blog, but I've been trying to blog quite regularly. And um, so hopefully that will be, will be posted when, when it's recorded and you can get hold of that. And um, that was our group that we traveled with. We had a fantastic, not all of these people went to South India though. This was our group in Northern India. And this is the caste system. You can see that it's, um, you still, people that are born into a caste usually still do marry within their caste. But as I say, it's been very, very um, relaxed now. And I believe that is the conclusion. And we headed in on an Emirates jet to head for home. So that's a little bit shorter and I hope it was a little more relaxed. We still hope you enjoyed all the the information and as you conclude we say namaste <laughs> yeah. well very colorful southern india i guess northern india was too but even more so yes yes it's a very different uh, very very different kind of of, um, of area yes as, as before your pictures are just wonderful and <laughs> your detailed explanation. I love the control your nerves on the curves. That's going to be my new motto. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the laundromat, and I still can't get over how they would ever know whose was what. Or... Oh, it just boggles my mind. It really did to have that many people in one area to do laundry. And then I saw a fellow, he was showering at the end of the so he worked hard and on the laundry and then he went over to another little corner and took the hose and just washed himself right down. Um, so that was interesting to see as well. I didn't put a slide of that in. Yeah. So, so they must, they had pumps or something for the water then. Yes, there was some, and you know, I wish I could answer that. But yes, there was, there was sort of, I'll use the term loosely, but running water throughout the whole area. Yes. So it, um, but in a monsoon, I still, it would be hard to think that oh, they would get much dry there. No. <laughs> I can't even imagine. I truly can't. And even walking through, you know, through any of the streets or anything, I truly can't. Because I've seen it in movies, of course. Um, I can't imagine being there during that time. I really can't. What month were you there? I, I forget. Oh, February, March. Yeah, February, March of 2013. Yeah. So it's definitely not the rainy season. You have no. great weather. There were a few days that were, were extremely hot, but we are to take a break from that heat. So, yeah. It's, um, how long were you on the houseboats? Like, how many days? Only two days. Right? Oh, okay. Two days? I think it was just one night. Yeah. And I think it was just the one night because, as I said, you could easily go by speedboat in 45 minutes, what it took us two days to do. <laughs> but 
the one that was, it was enough. Um, I believe there are other areas that have different um, itineraries, but it's, um, and perhaps we could have even done, there's lots of canal systems there. So it's, um, but it was, it was fascinating. It really was an interesting way to see that. That way. Yeah. Some of them looked like they were made like of woven straw or something like that. Yeah, um, especially the shutters over, over the windows. Like, I don't if you remember, there was one picture where they had them propped open the sides. And um, there was quite a bit of, of woven, woven reed work, yes. Um, the boats themselves were wooden, but some of the decor and the roofs were, were woven plants, yes. Yeah, so it's... Um, but no, it's it's a fascinating, amazing beliefs. Like another thing in Mumbai, distance were the um, towers of silence, where the the Parsi people um, put their dead. And because Mumbai has um, there's so many skyscrapers now, if you're buying a million dollar Penthouse. You certainly don't want to look down on a tower of silence with dead bodies on it. So they surrounded the remaining towers of silence by trees so that they're hidden, and then some have been built outside of the city. Mm -hmm. And um, also due to urban expansion, there aren't quite as many of the vultures and crows and birds that would help dispose of the bodies around. So it's not done quite as much as it used to be. But we at least got a chance to discuss it and talk about it. And, and um, it truly is an amazing, amazing country to visit. So in case you don't, didn't get what the Tower of Silence was, that's instead of cremation or burial, the bodies are put out into this open uh, enclosure where the birds and stuff... Um, take it away. Yeah, yeah take, take it, it away, away. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah it's, it's fascinating to read about them too. And, yeah. and um, there's a couple of good books. Um, there's a, a book called um, A Fine Balance. It's a fairly well known book, and I should, I can't remember the author's name, but it was about, about India. And I, I read it after we got back. And the next book I'm going to read, because I just haven't gotten around to ordering yet, is called A Suitable Boy. Oh, yes. And I believe there's three volumes. Okay, so you've heard of that one. Have you read it, Priscilla? Um, have you? Um, I have read it, but it's. Um... I'm not sure we still have it at the library. But okay. Both, okay. but you're right. They're both very well. There's quite a few really good yeah. books in, on India. So they have a lot of great authors there. I guess with that big a population, chances are good. Yeah. I have another question. So you have the beautiful pictures of the insects. Do yeah. they have mosquitoes there? We didn't have any trouble with mosquitoes. Um, did we that evening? Oh, there definitely have to be some, but we sat out after dark, and I do not remember putting bugs. If we did have insects, it would only have been in that little area of southern India where we were. Um, I just thought with all the water there. Yeah, the I mean, they're definitely there, but we weren't bothered by them. Let's put it that way. Um, they weren't. Must have been a long yeah, season or something. Yeah, yeah. So it's, but no, like but you say, the bats and the, well, no, they were fruit bats. They weren't normal bats. So, but the dragonflies would definitely feed on them, but just, just amazing insects. So, and, and that first lake, there was like tree stumps sticking out of it. Yeah. So that's been flooded or that's like. Yeah, I'm got one side, I think, to flood that area, wasn't it? I don't see the. But, um, yes, and I don't know again whether that's the flooding and, you know, your different levels, eventually the trees die. I'm, I'm not sure, Priscilla, I can't answer that. Jerry might be right on that. I'm sorry, I don't remember. Oh, that, that's okay. It just kind of looks like here when they put a dam in, then there's yeah, all yeah. the trees down there. Yeah. yeah, so it's... Um, and are you still drinking palm toddies? Haven't had one since. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure to get the palm sap from. <laughs> and it was strong. It was strong stuff. And another picture I didn't have in here, but there was an old guy sitting in the corner of the bar drinking and I didn't take his picture but drinking and I said wow he looks like he's had one too many and, and our guide said oh he's had about 10 too many the guy's actually only 25 <laughs> 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 so, 
<laughs> That's not a good recommendation. No, it's not. And, and uh, I don't really recommend taking a palm body from a guy walking down a path either. But uh, so, do they make alcohol too? Then, oh, like they ferment the, the the liquid from the palms? Or? Oh yeah. Oh, it was it was definitely it was oh, definitely oh, fermented. Yeah. Yeah. It was very very strong. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and they, and of course they have their own um, Indian beer. It's Corolla. It's Corolla, one of the beers. I know it's one of the state. But, you know, we um, drink the Palm Tardio. I don't remember drinking any other other strange drinks. Um, and the food was was pretty typical Indian food. Like, I can't remember something that was completely and totally off the wall that we tried this time. Um, some of our some of our group got tired of the Indian food. Um, in the northern part of our tour, as a tour guide, like we tried to have a Western meal thrown in once in a while. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, in the southern part, it wasn't quite as easy to do that, but the food was excellent. It was absolutely excellent. So, so but, yeah. but quite different northern to southern, I have the impression. No or no? I think so. Um, it's maybe fresher in the southern. I don't know if that would be a way of wording it. Um, but. Tourist area. There were there were more facilities for the tourists, and of course the spice farms. They all have programs, and they all had um, their healing um, things that they made out of their spices and things that they grew as well. So lots of healing things. Um, but and, and of course they export. They export all that. And, um, but I just, again, when I use a clove in a pot of soup now, I think twice about where it came from. I really, mm -hmm. and even pepper, even pepper, to see how, how pepper grows and how much it takes to harvest pepper has made me appreciate our herbs and spices much, much more. Well, and the coffee too. I didn't realize that you had to keep harvesting over and over again, that it didn't all ripen at the same time. Oh, coffee that, beans. that's correct. No, coffee doesn't. You're right. Like if you saw in that picture, there were green ones and red ones. Mm -hmm. And so it has to be basically picked by hand and then you reap it and you reap it. And um, whereas tea, you usually pick every, every six days. There's some places anyway that you pick every six days and just take the top leaves off. Um, but again, very, very time consuming. Yeah, it's all labor contents out right? there picking tea. Yeah. So this kind of brings me around to souvenirs. So you did show us some souvenirs from northern India, but maybe you know that... that I couldn't think of anything from southern India that we specifically yeah. added in. Um so you didn't bring back any spices or tea or coffee or we brought back some tea. But that's been that's already been consumed. Yeah. Um, I so. I'm trying to remember we brought, we brought back spices from various places and I can't remember what we did from there we certainly um, again we worry a little bit about customs when it's fresh produce spices are usually okay but um, and maybe at that point after two weeks in the north we felt our suitcases were getting heavy enough too but, um, but it was just and actually to be honest in the south we didn't really visit um, we didn't visit as many, like something like the Taj Mahal, where you would go and you would buy a, you know, something from the Taj Mahal. Like the South was a little more relaxed that way. We didn't really visit a gift shop, um, if that's the right wording. Um, and I'm just trying to, because I actually thought of that the other day and I couldn't come up with anything from, yeah, from the more South. Of a you know? rural thing. Yeah. Compared to the north. Yeah. So that, that makes it really interesting to see that. Oh, yeah. So, but you did make an album, I believe. Well, a book, a book. Make a book. Yes. We make a book. We don't do this on every travel, but when I learned how to do this, I just couldn't stop it. And it's so easy to just, you know, just go through it and all the information's in there. And we just, I just have fun with it. I've done family history stuff too, but it's, um, yeah, this is one of the biggest books I've ever done. So, it, uh, yeah. So that's something else that we really do enjoy enjoy as well. You're expert at that too. Yeah. 
but we love putting together the slideshows. And so I don't know if I asked you last time, but yeah. would you go back to India? Or there's so many other places you want to go? Um, I would go. There's, there's no question I would go back, but I think at this point, there's still other places I want to go to before I go back to India. Um, but I still haven't seen a tiger. So I might have to go back to India just to see a tiger. Um, and we enjoyed our stops from the cruise ship. So after this trip, the cruise ship, we stopped four different places along the Indian coast. So we got to see a little bit more of it that way. Um, yes, there's still, still things I would like to see. But I don't know if it's in the cards for the next little while. Yeah. yeah so. You do have plans for another trip. We've got a couple of things coming up. We have postponed because of COVID a trip to the Queen Charlotte Island to Haida Gwaii. And I was talking to my travel agent the other day and he says they're still hoping they may do it in June. Huh? I'm a little doubtful. Um, and then we would postpone it till next year. And then um, we are planning another trip to the Antarctic in February of 2022. And um, we're going to cruise there again on the Antarctic for, and I think have three days on land and a chance to do some sea kayaking. And then we'll finish in Santiago, Chile, and we hope to fly out to Easter Island. So that's all still in the works. And we know that with COVID happening, we don't know 100% sure if we'll get there or not, but but we have to start planning. So yeah, we don't have to, we want to start planning. Yeah, well, <laughs> we're, we're very much in your debt to, for sharing these travels with us. That's it's just wonderful. Well, we absolutely, really do enjoy doing it. And we thank you for inviting us very much. Let me have you back. Mm -hmm. I just want to mention the April program. Oh, yes. So Jerry Fian, um, will take us to Egypt this time. Oh, excellent. Okay. You've been to Egypt too? Yes, but it's been quite a long time ago. Okay. Um, so we have stopped at a couple of places from a cruise ship since then, yeah. but the actual Egypt itself was 2000. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so we would look forward to seeing it again, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, so his, Jerry's, Jerry's description is uh, the land of great pyramids and pharaohs. Um, he's an award-winning travel writer and photographer, and he sailed up the mighty Nile River and then visited Abu Simbel, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, Cairo, and Sharm el-Sheikh on the Red Sea. So that should be interesting too. And that's yeah. next time, next month. Can you believe it'll be April 7th? Wow. It's very yeah. hard to believe. <laughs> Thank you so much for getting us through the winter. Thank you, Priscilla. And anytime you need a speaker, we'd love to we'd love to participate again. You're definitely on my list. <laughs> thank you very, very much. And thank you everyone for listening. We thank you. Yes. That. Thanks again to our loyal audience. Have a thank good you. month. Thank, thank you. you. We will. Same to you. <laughs>